This is the first video having to do with uh, Module B data basics. This one is measurement scales. Measurement scales are actually quite important, both, though it's things that we don't usually think about. Um, it's, it's all around us, the concept of measurement, but we don't usually think about it in this way. However, if you're going to understand how data works and how to interpret data accurately, this is one of the first things you need to understand. Learning objectives are to understand uh, the difference between numerical and categorical scales. And if a scale is categorical, distinguish between unordered and ordered. If it's numerical, distinguish between continuous and discrete. The second one, continuous versus discrete, is not nearly as important as the first, which is uh, unordered versus ordered categorical. And the most important goal here is to distinguish between numerical and categorical. We'll get into this. So here's a basic principle that we need to learn, and you'll see about a thousand times in these lectures. The nature of the data determines the treatment of the data. You can't do certain things with certain kinds of numbers or categories. You have to treat the data in a way that respects what it is. This is extremely important, actually. So in this case, you need to learn how to tell what the nature of the data is. You need to be able to tell what scale of measurement data is measured on. So what is this thing called a scale? It means a lot of different things, but in statistics, we usually mean that a scale is a way of measuring. Measuring is more complicated than we think, but it's not, I mean, you can do it easily, but thinking about what's actually happening is fairly complex. It's when we observe something, something that matters to us as researchers or as people, and then we make a symbol somewhere that represents that observation. Later, the only thing that we have left is the symbols, and the observation itself is gone, it's past it's inaccessible to us. And so the way that we choose to turn observations into symbols is critical, and that's called a measurement system or a measurement scale, or sometimes you just say a scale. We worry about how much information is in the symbol because that determines what we can do with those symbols, how much information we can extract from those symbols. The amount of information that went into making them is directly related to the amount of information that we can get out of them. So if, you're trying, if you want to know something, run some statistics on some numbers and answer some research question, it really depends uh, the amount of information you can get from that research question and whether you can answer it well really depends on how much information is in that scale in the first place. And we can't measure everything about the things that we observe. You're always observing things or people or events or phenomena or concepts or something. You're observing something out there that's observable. But you can't measure everything about it, so you have to choose characteristics. And we'll talk about choosing one characteristic at a time. If When you measure one characteristic, from a group of related things, like say you look at a group of people and you measure how tall they are, then that characteristic becomes a variable. And sometimes I'll say a variable is a characteristic. So we wonder with measurement scales how much information from the observation is encoded in the symbol we wrote for that variable. So if you have a bunch of numbers or symbols on a page like this that were all collected from the same or from one group of similar individuals, cases, objects, then you ask yourself how much information from the original observation itself is encoded in those symbols. There can be at least three kinds of information. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but you can go through them at your leisure. So the first piece of information we could get, enco get encoded, and the most basic piece of information, is differences between the things. So if the things that we're observing are different from each other in the, in the characteristic we're observing, then we can do this. We observe the characteristic, and then we use a separate symbol to record each different way that the characteristic could go. Now, there are a lot of ways we talk about that. The characteristic we'll call a variable, and all the different possibilities for that variable we'll call categories or levels of the variable. So we use a separate symbol for each level of the variable. Uh, but things have to be naturally different on the characteristic. If you're observing something about humans that's not different, say, you're observing a bunch of humans and you say, my, my variable is whether or not each person breathes oxygen. As long as those humans are alive, that's not a variable. There's no variability. People are not different on, how they, on whether they breathe oxygen. They are different on how they breathe oxygen, so that's a different question, or how much. But on whether they breathe oxygen, the answer is yes for everybody. Yes, I breathe oxygen. So that's not a variable. So you need to at least have people 
or objects or things potentially different on the characteristic that you're observing before this can happen. So some examples of things that have only differences and nothing else encoded in them are some variables like sex. So you write male for all the males and female for all the females. Um, the make of cars, for instance. You could write people's religion. Now, don't be fooled by the fact that some people choose to write numbers for these categorical things like religion or sex or anything. The numbers attaching them to these categories doesn't make the scales numerical. It doesn't make them quantitative. They're still only qualitative scales. You, could, you couldn't do numbers on your statistics on these numbers, for instance. You couldn't get a 20 or 30 religions of people and attach numbers to those religions and then calculate an average. That would make no sense. It is nonsensical and crazy. All right, there's a small little footnote. So the second piece of information or kind of information that might be encoded in the scale is inherent order between the character, between the levels, between the categories in the, in the scale. But this has, only works if the characteristic being measured itself has a built-in order. Now, some characteristics don't, so sex and religion and things like that, they don't have a built-in order. But if things do have a built-in order, in other words, the individual cases might potentially have more or less of whatever it is you're measuring than other individual cases, then that's an ordered system. And you should use a symbol system that itself has a clear order to reflect that. So use numbers. And then with writing things down, this is probably pretty obvious. If one case has more of whatever you're measuring than another case, then make sure that that case has a higher symbol. So if you're measuring something like um, happiness in a group of people, then if one person is happier than another person, make sure that that person has a higher number, like five, and then the less happy person has a lower number, like three. So this is how you encode order. So examples, if a car finished second place in Le Mans, you write two instead of three for third place or one for first place. Now this is a tricky one because in this case, a higher number actually means they finished later, but it does mean a higher time. Anyway, it's kind of a reversed ordered thing, but it's really easy to reverse scales and you have to watch out for that. If a person agreed with an item on a survey but not a whole lot, you might write agree, whereas if they agreed a lot, you might write strongly agree. Um, when, if you're rating people on something that's very difficult to rate, sometimes you use these ordered scales. And so you might rate how charismatic a person is by writing five. Um, and maybe that's the highest point on your scale and a person is only somewhat charismatic, they get a three. If they have zero charisma, you write zero. We've all met people that have zero charisma. We've all had days where we had zero charisma. So regular intervals is the third kind of information that might be in measurements, and it's the most complex and the most useful type of information. So if the characteristic being measured is ordered, but, but the order is specifically quantifiable, that means you can measure it very precisely and reliability, reliably, limited only by your measurement tools, then assign numbers just like you did for the ordered system. But for every or observation, assign a number that is very specifically tied to exactly how much of the characteristic is present. What this means is, if you record 5.5 in your data sheet or something, and 10.5 for two separate observations, that second one needs to have exactly five of whatever it is you're talking about, more than the first. This is harder to achieve than it looks. There's, there will be scales where you think that's going on, but you haven't quite made it. Examples of this are all physical measurements and counting anything and percentages. So these things all have this numerical quantitative um, quality to them. So if you're counting the number of children in a family and one family has 10 children, the other has five, the second family really does have 10 more children than the first family. So this leads, these three kinds of information lead to these three types of measurement scales. If all you have in your measurement scale, if the only information encoded in it is whether things are different from each other, but not whether one thing is greater or less or anything like that, then you have a categorical measurement scale, a, an unordered categorical or a, a regular categorical scale. It's the most pure categorical type of scale. If you have a categorical scale that also includes order between the observations, then you have ordered categorical, sometimes called as an ordinal scale. And then if you have an ordinal scale that in addition 
truly has equal intervals or mathematically regular intervals between all the individual points on the scale, then you have an interval scale. Um, we're going to call it a numerical scale. Some people will call it interval or ratio, interval ratio scale. That's from another measurement system. So here's the system we have so far. We have numerical scales, and then we have two types of categorical scales, ordered and then unordered categorical scales. But we need one more quick distinction between types of numerical scales. It's not really a separate measurement scale per se, but it's just a little flavor that numerical scales can have that can be important from time to time. And that's continuous versus discrete. So let's talk a little bit about that. A continuous numerical scale is a scale where the spaces between the numbers on the scale can be divided infinitely into smaller and smaller and smaller spaces, leading to greater precision in measurement. So length, and all physical measurements like this, so length you could measure something and say it's 3 centimeters, or you could get a better measurement scale, like a, a better ruler and say it's 3.5. Let's say you're measuring a little worm or something. You could get an even better measurement scale and say it's 3.51 or maybe you have an electron scanning laser microscope thingy and it's, you actually find out it's 3.507. And anything truly numerical might be continuous and you have to kind of pay attention to whether this is possible. Uh, a gross domestic product, for instance, could be measured at varying levels of precision. You could get incredibly precise down to measuring fractions of a cent if it were possible to get that kind of information from a nation's economy. So anything like that that can be divided and divided and divided, that's a continuous scale. Now this doesn't mean that your particular measurement equipment or, or instruments can divide things infinitely. Sometimes it will be able to do that, sometimes it won't. What it means is that theoretically it could be that there's, that there's nothing but your measurement instruments keeping you from doing that. A discrete scale is the alternative, and that's where it does not make any sense to divide the spaces between the numbers. So anytime you're counting things that cannot be divided themselves uh, because of the way they're defined, that's a continuous scale, or sorry, a discrete scale. So for instance, you're asking how many nations are in the UN. You can't have a fraction of a nation. You can say, well, but Palestine, no, no, either it is or it isn't. And now some people might have different definitions, but in those people's minds, either it is or it isn't. You can't have a half a nation. Well, what about Canada? No, no, Canada's an entire nation too. The number of children that people have, that's a great example. Even if, you know, you have that one brother who's just not quite right in the head, it doesn't matter. He's still a whole individual. He still counts as one. You don't give him like a 0.5 or something like that. So a visual demonstration of continuous versus discrete. A continuous scale, let's say it's the kilograms of chocolate pudding that I ate last year. I could measure it in whole kilograms, 12, 13, 14, 15. Or I could measure it divided into like fifths of a kilogram or tenths of a kilogram. I could talk about it measured down as precisely as like twentieths or fortieths or fiftieths or hundredths or thousandths of a kilogram. I could talk about it in individual grams. I could keep dividing into tiny fractions of grams, and I could just keep going like that, down to the Planck constant, um, down like that. A discrete scale, let, here's an example, counting people is a great example of a discrete scale. The number of protesters who were arrested last week. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to say there were 14.5 protesters arrested. What would that even mean? So the gaps are regular between the numbers. The gap between 12 and 13 is the same as the gap between 15 and 16, i.e., one person. A gap of one person is a gap of one person, no matter what. So you can do math on this and everything. It's purely a numer numeric scale, but the values inside the gaps don't make any sense. The only values that make sense are the gaps themselves. So here's the system that we have. We have three types of scales, numerical, categorical, uh, ordered, and categorical, unordered. And then numerical scales, we can further talk about whether they're continuous or discrete. So let's talk about categorical scales briefly. Unordered categorical scales are scales in which the measurements represent only the pure categorization of observations with no order whatsoever uh, involved. There's no way to quantify the order on the characteristic being measured. Now don't fool yourself because you can shift scales. You can say, oh, but I can measure religion. I can measure which one has most participants. Well, now you've shifted your variable. You're not talking about what religion a person belongs to. Now you've shifted to which religion has the most participants, and that's, that's a different thing. Uh, 
But if you're sticking with the pure categorical scale, then it has no way to order the, the different categories relative to each other. It makes no sense at all. So an awful lot of demographics work, work that way. Religion, your political affiliation, the type of job you do, your sex, your ethnicity, your nationality. All of these things are purely categorical, unordered um, uh, variables, scales, in the way we usually define them. So ordered scales are measurements that reflect a natural order in the characteristic, but we can't tell how much of the characteristic. We just know that one individual might have more of it than another individual, and another individual might have less than that individual, but we can't tell how much more or how much less because the intervals between the categories are not regular, or sometimes they're just not defined, therefore we can't prove them to be regular. We run into this problem sometimes in the behavioral sciences when we create questionnaires. So some examples are individual Likert scale items, the strongly agree, strongly disagree, those types of scales. Those are ordered because there's no way to say that the difference between strongly agree and agree is the same as the difference between strongly disagree and disagree. We can't say that the gaps between each of the points on the scale are the same or even related to each other in any mathematical way. It's very difficult to define that. Or Olympic medals, first, second, third, gold, silver, bronze. Uh, yeah, clearly gold is, is better than silver and silver is better than bronze, but how much better? Couldn't you be the gold medal winner who kicked everybody's butt by a mile and then silver and bronze are right next to each other? That could happen. Or it could be that gold and silver are next to each other and bronze is far away. Or they're all equally spaced. The point is that from just knowing gold, silver, and bronze, you can't tell. There, there's no way to tell how far apart those individual categories are from each other. So an important characteristic is not treating, or an important rule, is not treating categorical variables as if they were numerical. No statistics that are created or intended for numerical data should be used for categorical data. Now, when I, there are maybe some exceptions in the behavioral sciences, but not very many, and if I encounter them, maybe I'll talk about those. But in general, follow this rule. Don't ever use something that's created for a numerical scale don't use it for a, ca a categorical scale, even an ordered categorical scale. What you need to be able to do for this class, as far as this lecture goes, is be able to look at the verbal description of a measured variable, like in a word problem that describes something researchers have studied, and determine where it fits in this scheme. It's actually not critical to determine whether it's continuous or discrete, although that's important. It is critical to determine whether it's numerical or categorical, and then it's critical to determine if it's categorical, whether it's regular or ordered. So finally, let's return to this basic principle. The nature of the data determines the treatment of the data.